Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, a King Killer Chronicle reread podcast. We are your hosts, Will and Phoenix. Let's get into it. Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, Season 2, Episode 59, Making Love, Not War, where we will be looking at Chapters 120 and 121 of The Wise Man's Fear through the lens of creation versus destruction. So as per usual, short explanation of the pod, each week we will be examining a section of The Wise Man's Fear through a chosen lens and figuring out what we can take from the text to apply to our real lives. We will also take time to focus on the phonemes of the week, and then we will share a recommended thing of the week, or every other week. Finally, we will wrap things up with seven words from the book and seven words from our own lives. Before we begin, let's get some disclaimers out of the way. First of all, we are in no way affiliated with Patrick Rothfuss or his publisher, Dot Books. Second of all, we are going to spoil the crap out of this book. I mean, the book's almost 10 years old, so. And we're almost done with it. You have been warned. Also, a word to our community. Please be kind to yourselves, one another, and the creators of the worlds that we love exploring. And while this will be coming out a little over a week past when we recorded it. Today, on the day that we are recording this, it is International Trans Day of Visibility, and I want to wish every single person a very merry, happy, whatever, Trans Day of Visibility. Sorry I'm late. Thank you. All right, so we'll start with chapter 120 here, Kindness. I do actually want to discuss our creation versus destruction lens a little bit before we get into the book. That's fair. So heretofore, Quoth has been dealing primarily with all of the stuff that he's learning, pretty much just through the lens of fighting. How do you destroy your opponent? How do you achieve victory? How do you achieve dominance? Like that's just his lens through everything right now. It is interesting to me how ingrained things can become. And I think this is an example of that. And I think part of that comes from his upbringing. I mean, pretty much from the time he lost his parents, he's been pretty much in a struggle for survival and constantly been besieged by people who are trying to dominate him in one fashion or another. So he is naturally thinking of everything in terms of a struggle against enemies. I mean, I, there is a joke to be had about Florian, but I'm, I'm not going to make it. Nope. Nope. I think it's also worth pointing out, though, that that's not all of who Kvothe is. Those martial elements, those power-seeking elements, are something that he's adapted to pretty much as a necessity. But fundamentally, like, if we think about the part of him that, you know, is with his core wound, the part of him that is the thing he holds dearest, the thing that he only lets out sparingly. It is that creative side that he gets from his parents and his family, the thing that was taken from him, but that he carries with him. I'm going to say that sometimes there is a public face and a private face, and sometimes we do not see our own public face for what it is, and the person that we believe we are is our private face. But that's not what a lot of people see of us. And I think that's what Kvoth is experiencing right now, his privately held view of himself is that of a creator, and his public persona is more of a destroyer. Right. It's that question of mask versus self, and the thing that is masked and the thing that does the masking. I think effective masks typically work because they expose something that is true, and the mask you wear oftentimes does say something about who you are underneath the mask but it also doesn't show the whole thing. There's an interesting thing about masking. A lot of neurodivergent people have learned to put on a mask of normalcy and internalize their own natural behaviors or things that are compelling to them or the emotions they want to express or not even want to express, but like feel a need to express, but feel like they can't in public at least. There's an internalized shame around that. There is an internalized, oh my goodness, I can't show the entire world my real face. And so we all learn to mask the things that are unpleasant to neurotypicals or to who we think are neurotypical or what we think 
a neurotypical person wouldn't want to tolerate. I think in Quoth's case as well, he's someone who's become very adept at presenting a pleasant face, presenting an empathetic face because he feels that's what people want. But being genuine is something that's very difficult for him. And again, a lot of this comes down to those years of trauma between when he lost his parents and pretty much up till now. He's had a few bright spots here and there, but fundamentally he's had a very difficult time truly letting people in. So much of Foth's performance has been in the interest of survival or trying to get what he wants, but very little has come through from him about who he is at his core. And when he's had success, it's been in those almost unconscious moments when he's been able to drop the facades and be truly honest about who he is, uh, revealing those yearnings, those aches, those pains, those losses that you know really define him as a character. He's a character of contradictions, as we all are. We exist in tensions, and it can be very easy to view ourselves in the most unflattering possible light as if our negative side is all that is real about us. Our destructive side is the only part that's real. It's the only defining part of ourselves. But I tend to look at it differently. I think we have these light sides and dark sides, but they aren't neatly divided. And I don't think that one is more real or less real than the other. We're all kind of just blended throughout and you can't just neatly separate one from the other. I think all you can do is just accept that I can have a complex view of myself as a creator and a destroyer. These are both parts of who I am. And if I can accept that about myself, that both of those things are true, I can also accept that about the people in my life. So that's our big general discussion here. Let's start diving into the text because I think there's some really fascinating stuff in here that I want to get to. So we start off with kindness, which is mostly just a dinner conversation between Pentha and Quoth, which honestly, I, it made me tear up a little bit. Quoth is viewing the Adam as a monolith and not as individuals with their own views and thoughts and actions. He's seeing them as a culture and not as individuals. And so he assumes everyone almost kind of has groupthink. And especially right now when he is feeling so low, he assumes that the groupthink is all negative about him. And I think a lot of us have had those feelings where we've assumed that if people think about us, they think negatively about us. Even though, like, if you look at what your own thoughts are about your friends and your family and other people, the chances of those thoughts being solely negative or a majority negative or even really negative ever, like the chances of that being the case, like your thoughts about your fellows, your friends, your family, almost always are going to be something positive or neutral. You're not just sitting there stewing and thinking about all the negatives about the people you love. And so I think it's a great unkindness to feel that everyone who has a relationship with you automatically is viewing you negatively or is being mean to you or is being rude or awful or just has this negative cloud over your face in their head. I doubt that's the case for most people. And I doubt that's the case, like, if individuals of the Adam society are thinking about Quoth, it's almost certainly not all strictly negative. I think also it's very easy to run into this challenge when you are in an unfamiliar place, when you feel like the outsider already. It's very easy to fall into us versus them thinking. And when you are in a new territory where you are obviously not one of the in group, it's very easy to recognize yourself as part of the out group. And sometimes you project that a little bit, you know, especially after his most recent training with Fichette, where he pretty clearly realizes that he has crossed some boundaries and that he has definitely missed something crucially important. 
this is kind of him at his lowest moment. He has been humbled in ways that he didn't think he ever would be. He's not used to because Quoth being sort of the autodidact genius kid is used to being good at everything. He's used to learning quickly. He's used to going from success to success. So it's very difficult for him to accept failure gracefully. And this is his first real humbling moment where he truly realizes just how out of his depth he is in this and what the true stakes of it are. And it's also one of those times where his great strength, his ability to communicate, to empathize, to persuade is suddenly not a strength, but a weakness, a liability. He's having a hard time with it. You know, he's in pain physically and mentally <laughs> and emotionally. And, you know, he feels like everything he does to try and correct the situation is only making things worse. So when Pentha approaches him at this lowest point with, you know, humility, like she doesn't approach him in judgment. She approaches him with curiosity and compassion. And, you know, this is also someone who is looking for help in the same way that he needs help. They both need to work on their ability to communicate in an unfamiliar situation. She is struggling to learn a Turin, and he is struggling to learn a Demic, both very different languages and with very different sets of cultural connotations and norms baked into them. So they have just this very quiet little conversation that's, you know, trying to figure out how to talk with one another in their own languages. And Kvothe is also dealing with bottling his natural expression of his emotions. Finally having someone saying, no, please show me how that expression of emotions actually works. It's like a dam bursting for him. And it comes out in a confusing flood. I thought it was kind of sweet, you know? And the way that, you know, initially she's like, why are you crying? <laughs> and did I hurt you? And he's like, no, it's not that you've been incredibly kind to me at a time when I don't feel like I deserve it. Being able to express those contradictions is an interesting challenge, especially when you're not sure what those norms actually are. Even as he's trying to communicate to her in her language and she's trying to communicate to him in his language, they kind of meet in the middle. I'm curious for your thoughts on this. I think what interests me the most in this section is not just that Pentha is breaking with the rest of the Adem and being kind and empathetic and curious and wanting to learn from both. I think the blending of the two languages to understand one another better is beautiful because they're speaking in a Turin, but they're still using hand signals to add nuance so that they understand each other better. I also think that maybe assimilation is not the right way to handle things. Having to squish yourself in order to fit in, not being allowed to express yourself in the way that you feel comfortable so that you can be forced to use a different language or a different cultural norm. I like having that blend much more than I like having a this or that. Cultural scholars refer to this as syncretism, where instead of expecting someone who immigrates to a new country to completely adopt all of the norms and cultures and expectations of their new home. They start where they are and they bring their own unique take on things and then blend it with what's already there while retaining their own sense of distinctiveness. It's not really that whole melting pot idea, which sort of turns everything into a bland homogenous soup, but rather it's more like a, a salad where you have a bunch of disparate ingredients that still shine through distinctively and at the same time complement and contrast in ways that enhance everything. So yeah, like in this case, we have Foth using a Turin norms around facial expressions and things like that 
And then also providing the context to Pentha using the ADEM hand sign that she's used to. And she's doing the same thing to try and course correct as needed. Pentha very gingerly steps around discussing Vachette. Obviously, everyone knows that Vachette and Quoth have gone off into the woods together. And it's not really culturally like odd. But I think Pentha knows the Aeturan culture well enough to know that it's a more delicate subject for Quoth. I think also she does know of the importance of the master and student dynamic or teacher and student more accurately and just how intimate that can be, especially in Adamic society. Quoth says, I have none that I am close to and signs gentle regret. He had hoped that he was growing close to Vachette, but he fears that he's lost that connection, that he's ruined everything with his actions that day. And Pentha's response is interesting. Vachette left a mark on Quoth's face on purpose. She has enough control where she didn't have to do that. She could have hit him in a way that left no marks, but still caused the same amount of pain. She wants everyone to see that Quoth forked up. Of course, Quoth hadn't registered this until this moment. I think when Quoth recognizes that everyone can see his shame and that Pentha is still talking to him anyway. Like that's, that's what really brings him to tears. That recognition that everyone can see my deepest shame, my failure. And here is someone who sees that and is still kind to me. Like that's a very loving thing to do. And that is something that Quoth needed in this moment, especially once he realizes that this isn't just he just hurts, but that marks are visible on his face, that everyone knows what this means. You know, I think having someone who is respected, someone who is seen as having skill and knowledge, still thinks that he is of value in spite of everything. That's something that he's needed at that lowest moment. And I think we can all think of times when we felt this way, where you know, we feel rejected where we feel vulnerable, where we feel like failures. And having that someone in your life who provides you with kindness unlooked for, it means a lot. I'm sorry I'm getting weepy. I honestly don't mind. I think it's sweet. I think this section is very powerful, especially for those of us who have felt low and who have needed friends, but also for those of us that can recognize when others are feeling low and put out the effort to prop them up. And that's something that you have done as well. Now, total tonal shift on this, because I want to at least feed the theory beast a little bit. (laughs) Pentha has the same description of how her eyes change color that Quoth gets. Not very many characters get that specifically called out that their eyes changed from a lighter color or a clearer color to a darker, stormier color, like a physical manifestation of emotion. But definitely Quoth does and definitely Pentha does. So what do you think that that means, though? Like, that we get that specifically called out? So I think typically when we see Quoth's eye color changes described, It's usually meant to evoke the duality of his nature, sort of the charming musician and then the tortured hero underneath. And I think that also speaks to a similar duality within Pentha. Pentha is also both a creator and a destroyer. She is a skilled fighter. Like our first introduction to her is her winning a duel against the grandmaster of the school. That's not nothing. And that speaks to this controlled fury that she is able to harness for her fighting. But at the same time, the version of her that we meet here is sweet and open and curious and creative. And I think it's similarly a duality that we see in Quoth. He can be extremely angry. He can be 
destructive. And he can also be gentle and sweet and thoughtful. One thing that actually struck me is he describes Pentha here. Let me find the this exact quote here because this is really interesting. Pentha's smile was bright as a new penny. It was like cool water on my dry, tired heart, which really reminded me a lot of the language that Kvothe uses to describe Ari. His language with Ari is quite poetic. It's metaphor on top of metaphor. And I think there is an element where they're both taking a similar role in his life. They're both sort of serving as respites for Kvothe in a hostile world. When Kvothe feels unloved and rejected at the university, it's Ari who is there to remind him of that other part of him, the part that is gentle and compassionate and creative. And here in a Demre, where Kvoth is feeling isolated and ostracized and threatened, it's Pentha who is that reminder of his creative side. So her smile is sort of heartbreaking to Kvoth in that beautiful way. And he says, you know, you have a mouth that would inspire me to write. And he almost says songs. And he has to course correct here because singing is kind of a verboten thing. And says poetry. And so for the first time... Actually, no. Pentha says a poem? Yeah. <laughs> and for the first time, he's like, yes, a poem. The thing I hate. <laughs> oh, he didn't say that. He didn't say that, but we know what his feelings on poetry are. And so he kind of thinks for a little bit here. So after a little bit of prodding from Pentha, Kvoth agrees to compose a poem in Edemic. As long as she also composes a poem for him in Eterin. This is what Kvoth comes up with. Double-weaponed Pentha, no sword in hand, her flower mouth curves and cuts a heart a dozen steps away. He does miss his lute at this moment, because it would make it easier for him to compose. We know his thoughts. Then Pentha thinks for a bit, and this is what she comes up with for Kvoth. Burning as a branch, Kvoth speaks, but the mouth that threatens boots reveals a dancing bear. And in this way, I think there's a kind of silliness to it, which is at once disarming and sweet. It's Kvoth recognizing just how clumsy his efforts have been so far. <laughs> and then being able to own up to that. He says, it's the first poem anyone has ever made for me. It's lovely. And he was being honest. This does so much to brighten his mood and also to bolster his courage. It's also, I think, one of those crucial reminders that he's going to need. Like, it's not like everything is fixed. He still has to figure out what his next steps are with Vachette, because he clearly needs to resolve some things there. And it doesn't make it so that he is no longer in danger. But I think it does give him some much needed perspective. And I think it's perspective that he wouldn't have been able to accept in a position of pride. There's a line break. So we're out of that scene and into a different one. I was uncertain as to whether or not we had been flirting is such a relatable sentence. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I just have to say, like, as an awkward, geeky person who really likes just having in-depth conversations and being very interested in other people and in what other people's interests are and all of that, like, I, I have never understood flirting. Yeah. You know, as someone who has gone through life believing that no one is interested in me like that, it has oftentimes been difficult for me to tell if someone is just being friendly to me or if they're actually interested in me. And I've typically just erred on the side of saying they're probably not interested in me. Well, at this point, Quoth travels to Fichette's house where she is outside on a wooden bench. He steals himself and she stops him from speaking. 
because he has a clever tongue and all he's going to be doing is speaking from a place of fear and an attempt to smooth things over. And she doesn't want to hear it. She doesn't want to be manipulated. She doesn't want him to apologize without sincerity. She has this bit here where she says, early on, I noticed a gentleness in you. It is a rare thing in one so young. And it was a large piece of what convinced me that you were worth teaching. But as the days pass, I glimpse something else, some other face that is far from gentle. I have dismissed these as flickers of false light, thinking them the brags of a young man or the odd jokes of a barbarian. But today, as you spoke, it came to me that the gentleness was the mask. And this other half-seen face, this dark and ruthless thing, that is the true face hiding underneath. She says that Shayan has seen it and that it is not a lack of the Lothani, but that makes her unease more and not less. It seems to be something the Lothani cannot mend. And she needs to sleep on this. She needs to decide whether he's worth continuing to train or not. And she leaves. So at this point, Kvoth is starting to feel a little desperate. He feels trapped in spite of that moment he had with Penta, he recognizes that his future is on the line right now. His life is on the line right now. And, you know, he spends some time wandering aimlessly and it's not doing anything for him. And as he stares at himself in the mirror after a bath, he feels a low anger. I was, I decided, tired of waiting helplessly while others decided whether I could come or go. I had played their game, learned their language, been unfailingly polite, and in return, I had been treated like a dog. I had been beaten, sneered at, and threatened with death and worse. I was finished with it. That has some serious incel vibes. Oh, yeah. Like, there's a couple things that are true. One, he has been treated pretty poorly throughout this entire thing. Two, a lot of it has also been stuff that he's kind of brought on himself, mostly by inserting himself into the situation in the first place. I don't know that he has been treated poorly. I think he's been treated the same way they would treat, like, I don't want to say exactly the way that they would treat one of their own because there's still a very definite boundary of otherness, but they have agreed or acquiesced or whatever words you want to use to show him their ways and their ways are gruff to him. Maybe poorly isn't the right word. Harshly might be better. Yes. In the same way, though, that they treat everyone harshly. And throughout all of this, you know how we were talking earlier about assimilation versus syncretism? It feels like Kvothe has been holding himself to the assimilationist view of himself. And that everyone else actually has been, if not outright saying you have to assimilate, not giving him openings to be himself plus learning the Edemic culture. It's just assimilate. It's not blend. And it's not show your own uniqueness, not express yourself in the way that you are happiest doing so. I mean, one of the few ways that Quoth knows how to express himself honestly is through his music. Which has been absolutely unequivocally banned yeah the one thing that allows him to access that deeper part of himself that wounded child is something that he's been forbidden from touching you know he hasn't been able to really be vulnerable because the thing that he uses to be vulnerable with has been cut off from him and so this section these last few five paragraphs I think are meant to sound like a negative or negative is the wrong word malicious heel turn it sounds nefarious it sounds spiteful revengeful resentful not sure but Kvothe goes around her buying and stealing items to make a momet of whom we don't know I can't remember I think it's of himself but in the past, his use of these tools has been to cause harm on others. And so I think there's a bit of an expectation that this is about protecting himself through offensive means. And the last sentence of this chapter, what do any of us have when words fail us? Leading into the next one page chapter, when words fail. 
In the middle of the night, he revisits Vachette. She still wore her mercenary reds, but she had removed most of the silk ties that held it tight to her, so she's more comfortable. It's kind of like taking your bra off when you get home. Speaking of, cultural norms are weird, and the fact that we, as a society, have gone back to feeling like that's the only way that women can go out of the house is by having that particular undergarment is stupid. Anyway, <laughs> so he doesn't try to go in. Instead, he beckons her to come out. He doesn't speak. He uses his hands, his demeanor. He's trying to appeal to her curiosity. And she follows Sans sword, which is very clearly called out. She did not bring her sword. <laughs> And another thing for those theory buffs, it was a clear night and we had a piece of moon to light our way. The moon is a character in this book. And so he takes her as far away as he feels reasonable, so about a mile, in a small grove of trees, in a space that would be isolated and keep noise from traveling back to the town. And he's already set up a little space which I think we're still supposed to think he's being malicious. I think that narratively, we are still supposed to feel like this is dangerous. If I look at everything, all of the stuff that Quoth has been gathering, they seem like contingencies that he hopes he doesn't have to use. Because he's got this one last Hail Mary to get out of this peacefully. I think that we're supposed to think he's using the things that he has gathered I think we're supposed to think that this is going to be bad. So when he arrives at this grove, he's used his shade to create a little curtain raised between Vachette and himself. Something so that it can cater to her comfort level because he's going to play his lute. And we can feel that sense of relief the moment he opens the case and picks it up. He hasn't played in over a month. His calluses have gone soft. And, you know, as someone who's, this is the geekiest way that I can describe it. I've recently gotten a lot of metal sharp edged dice. And if I hold them in my right hand on my fingertips, they hurt, especially like the Caltrop D4. Those things are painful. They are sharp. They're like a pinprick. But if I hold them on my left fingers, my left hand, it doesn't hurt. You can feel the pressure, but there's not that pain because I've developed those calluses. And I can tell you that if I don't practice, they go away. My fingers get way more sensitive. And picking up a stringed instrument after you've left it for long enough where that's gone is a weird juxtaposition between fulfillment and beauty and music and pain. Do you agree? I agree. Yeah, I know, like, when I go a long time without practicing, I always feel better after I pick up my instrument and start playing. And even when, you know, it gets to the point of discomfort on my fingies, having them moving again feels good. He goes through songs that sound like weeping. He goes through his mother's favorite song. He thought of her and began to cry. He also played the song that hides in the center of himself. The one I can only assume is the same as what he played for hours and hours and hours after his parents' passing. He says, I would like to say it is a happy song, that it is sweet and bright, but it is not. And I think this is also recognizing that sweet and bright is not the only kind of good. Something that is dark and sad can also be good, can have beauty to it requires vulnerability and that's something that Quoth really struggles with understandably so right i mean like those years in tarbian made it very difficult for him to show vulnerability because in that scenario vulnerability was a risk to survival and so he's had to be very choosy about how he expresses himself and his loot and his music has been one of the safest ways for him to do that. And so I think he knows that anything he says, Vachette will dismiss as glibness, as you know, manipulative, as being just an effort to save his skin. So instead, he's taken the opposite path of saying, okay, I'm going to show who I truly am in the way that 
I know best. This is not Kvothe saying, I'm going to show the Adem the Adem way. I am going to show Vachette the Kvothe way. And Vachette moves the shade so that she can look at him. But the moon hung behind her and he could not see her expression. So he just says, this is why I do not have knives instead of hands, Vachette. This is what I am. And I think that's a really beautiful way to show his creative side, the side of himself that he hides a lot behind a happy face, behind a winning smile to show the wound, the pain that he lives with on a daily basis. I think this is a conversation that he could only have after kind of coming to that recognition of what he needed when speaking with Pentha. I think in this case, Pentha was a catalyst for that, for him. That kindness was what unlocked the ability to recognize that maybe he needs to be himself, not who he thinks the ADEM need him to be. So with that, I believe it's your turn for our Phronemos of the Week. You would be correct. And part of me wants to do a shout out for Vachette for recognizing that making a decision while still angry is a poor choice. Making a very big decision when you are clouded with an emotion, be it anger, be it love, lust, be it sadness, be it frustration, be it anxiety. Making large decisions when you're not clear-headed, it's one of the ways that we experience destruction. So I want to make sure I call that out, but I think that the Phronemos needs to be Pentha. She's not taking what other people say as gospel. She's not taking other people's opinions and choosing to use those to form her own she is choosing to go to the source to form her own. There are so many times where we get a story that is somebody else's story of somebody else's story of somebody else's story of events. And in our current media environment, we can go and search for the original source, but most of us don't. And my experience of this is specifically, I'm thinking of when I learned about the catalyst for Gamergate. And I learned about it because some sexist dash hole was railing against Zoe Quinn. And this was literally like right after all of these events happened. And it was really easy to see what the truth of the matter was, which is a jealous ex trying to badmouth her. But instead, there was this just god awful take that was being spread around about her and all of this slut shaming and like just vitriolic crap being spread. And all it took for me was a Google search to find out what the heck had actually happened. I remember he accused her of using her relationship with a writer at Kotaku as a way to get better game reviews for her projects. When even just a simple Google search even just looking through their archives would show you that her game had never been reviewed. Right. But we digress. That is not what this is about. What this is about is more, I could have taken that guy's view as gospel and been mad at her. A person I've never met, an issue I've never known about until this point. Or I could do a simple Google search, which is what I did. Pentha could take what everyone else is saying as her own opinion, take that on as her own opinion and run with it or talk to Kvothe. I think there's also something where she recognized a unique set of skills that Kvothe could teach her that nobody else in Edemre could. And his failure to conform to the norms of Edemic society well, maybe in this case, that isn't such a bad thing, since that's exactly the thing that she needs help with. She wants to understand how to not so much fit into a tour in society, the outside world, but she wants to understand how to move through it and make sense of it. Which is why she asks about the smiling and also points out how there's nuance in facial expressions in the same way that there's nuance in hand expressions and gives Quoth a different perspective on his own culture, on his own language. I think there's a lot to be said about how she asks for help. There is something about 
asking for help or asking someone to do a thing that they are good at for you that instantly bonds to people in a positive way. It disarms the other person. It engenders one to the other. And I think it opened up more empathy for Quoth as well and showed Pentha the side of himself that he wants to be the public face. And I think it puts him in a place where he can feel safe the way he knows how to, to show himself. I think you picked a good one. Thank you. So I have the thing of the week. So like many 90s kids, I grew up with the X-Files. I've always loved its blend of mystery, horror, science fiction, and humor. I've also become accustomed to creator Chris Carter's fondness for well-placed needle drops. So naturally, when he released a 1996 CD compiling some of his favorite music that was either inspired by or inspiring to his work, I took notice. This compilation, Songs in the Key of X, quickly went out of print and for various reasons probably stemming from the sinister machinations of the cigarette-smoking man was unavailable legally online. I can neither confirm nor deny that I have ever heard it in a less-than-authorized fashion. The lone gunman may or may not have played a role in that. Anyway, fast forward to October 2023 when Mondo Records released the full compilation on vinyl for the first time. Yeah, naturally I knew I had to pick this up. This has been kind of a holy grail for me for a long time. As you might expect, it did not disappoint. From Carter's unhinged lunacy in the liner notes, which are worth a read, it is unhinged and it is delightful, to the secret Nick Cave in the Bad Seeds track on side D, the entire package is just start to finish awesome. Some of my favorite tracks on here are the Foo Fighters cover of Down in the Park, Alice Cooper and Rob Zombie's industrial banger Hands of Death, Nick Cave and the Bad Seed's most famous song Red Right Hand, Danzig at his Danzigiest on Deep, The Meat Puppets Unexplained, Elvis Costello's and Brian Eno's beautifully esoteric My Dark Life, and of course, you've got a couple versions of the classic X-Files theme. One, the version that was used in the show by composer Mark Snow. And then there's another remixed by PM Dawn. That said, even the tracks that I haven't listed here are definitely worth a listen. And, you know, if you're looking for a good spooky time, hard to go wrong. If you have a chance, pick it up. I enjoy that record. It's not my favorite thing in the world, but it's definitely worth a listen, especially if you are super nostalgic for the X-Files. Yeah. So that it's time to get our seven words. Uh, you have the words from the book. I think I'm going to keep it very simple. There are only a few that I found that are pretty good and one that I kind of liked. So back to the whole assimilation versus syncretism thing. Kvothe and Pentha are having a conversation about facial expressions and Kvothe says, Keeping my face still is very hard. He doesn't like feeling like he can't express his emotions through his face. I'm even feeling all of the facial expressions that I am currently making. And I know I could not keep my face still. A part of a sentence, this just seemed to spur her on. When Kvothe protests and says, I cannot possibly make you a poem. And Pentha's like, but no, 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 you have to try now. The realization of... Oh my goodness, Vachette left marks on my face, and that was on purpose. I did not realize this until now. But I think I want to go with something a little more sweet and a little more endearing. You have the perfect mouth for smiling. I think that was a lovely compliment. Generally, I think it's nice and best to compliment someone on a thing that they chose. So like, I like the shirt that you're wearing. It looks flattering on you. Or I love your collection of Lego and the choices that you made about where to place them. Those kind of things. Like, you know, I like that joke. It was funny. All of these compliments that you can choose to say that aren't strictly about appearance or something that wasn't chosen. Like, hey, I like your hair color when I clearly, clearly have pink and purple hair right now. You know, that's something I obviously chose to do versus like, your eyes are so beautiful. And I'm like, that's an accident of genetics. <laughs> or, you know, you should smile more. That, meh, that's gross. But like in a conversation here where she is feeling insecure about smiling, about her ability to express herself with others in a way that is so 
quote, natural to other cultures, but not to her own. She's choosing to smile. She's choosing to express herself this way. And I think it's very sweet of Quoth to acknowledge that and encourage her. Yeah, he's recognizing something that she feels insecure about and then reassuring her that actually you are good at this. Like in this case, smiling is something that she is attempting to do. <laughs> it, honestly, complimenting her smile in this case would be the same as her complimenting his martial arts forms because this is something that she is trying to practice, something that she is trying to do better at. And so he is saying, you have the perfect mouth for smiling. You are good at this thing that you are trying to do. You can do this. You don't need to be insecure about it. It is an odd inversion of how we normally would think of a compliment for a person's smile. All right. And with that, it is your turn for seven words from life. This one came courtesy of our little Sokka, our little podcat. Oh, look at Sokka's little turkey leg. I'm sure that all of our pet people have had those moments where they just look at their little creature that lives in their house and go, he's so cute. Yeah, this morning Sokka had us both trapped because like, he does this thing where his rear leg just looks like a little turkey leg and he just kind of had it sticking out over my leg and I couldn't move because there was a turkey leg on my leg. We do refer to his little ham hock as a turkey leg quite often. Because he is a ham bone. <laughs> he a big kitty. I thought you said he was tiny. He is a tiny kitty because all cats are tiny. All cats? All cats are tiny. Even saber-toothed tigers. Tiny? They're cats. You said all cats are tiny. So by your logic, all saber-toothed tigers are also tiny, even though they're bigger than us. Still tiny. Okay, anyway, for a house cat... Sokka is kind of a big boy, but all cats are tiny. And so he stretches. And when I say big boy, I don't mean fat. He's just long. He's very long. <laughs> and so he'll stretch from one end of the couch where Will is to the other end of the couch where I am and trap us both. And in this particular instance, he trapped Will by sticking a turkey leg on him. It's quite adorable. This happens quite often. We'll make sure there are some pictures on, on Discord of examples of turkey leg. Will we? Will Will? Maybe. If I can remember to take pictures when these things happen. That's the challenge for me. Also, it is really hard to photograph a black cat. Yes. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you for potting with me. Thank you for potting with me. And thanks for listening to Tales from the Waystone. Join us next time on Tales from the Wavestone as we discuss chapters 122 and 123 of The Wise Man's Fear through the lens of nonlinear progression. We would like to thank our friend Shawnee Jang for our theme music. And many thanks to Patrick Rothfuss for creating a world that we've enjoyed exploring together. Audio production and editing, and we're going to call it social media coordination, courtesy of me, Phoenix McCullough. And writing and project management, courtesy of me, Will McCullough. If you would like to help support us and have the means to do so, and would like to hear our thoughts on the Sandman, please consider supporting us over on Patreon, patreon.com slash waystonepod. And as always, here's to one more day above the roses. To one more day above the roses. Ding! Ding. Also, uh, unrelated, you've got a little uh, thing on your nose. Thank you so very much. You got it. Cool, cool. because otherwise you're just going to be staring at my nose and not listening to me the entire time. That's why I, I wanted to tell you early. <laughs> it's just like, like that's going to bother me, and that's going to be really weird to Phoenix. And <laughs> you got it, so we're good. <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. Any other grooming tips before we start? It's not grooming tips. It's just a thing that I knew would bother me and then in turn bother you. And that's the only one. You're good. Is there anything I need to worry about? No. Okay, cool. <laughs> I love you. Wow. Hey, I want to give us a chance for success. And I don't want you thinking I'm looking at you weird. <laughs> I mean, 
sometimes you do look at me weird. But not for this. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. 